In this video, we will be talking about doubts related to salivary glands. So the first doubt is, what is non-suppurative sialodenitis? Now as the name suggests, sialoadenitis, it means inflammation of salivary gland, which can be of several types. We have an acute bacterial suppurative sialodenitis. And as the name is suggesting, the causative organism is a staph organism with formation of pus. Then we have viral mumps. Then we have autoimmune sialodenitis, which includes disorders like uh, sarcoidosis. Then... Uh, we come to our chronic sialodenitis or non-suppurative sialodenitis, uh, which is characterized by uh, intermittent swelling of salivary gland with an obvious palpable mass without formation of any pus. Now, the etiology for this is usually a salivary duct calliculi, obstruction of the duct due to tumors, foreign body and scar formation. And if it is left untreated, it can lead to chronic sclerosing sialodenitis, which is also known as Kuttner's tumor. And if you look through the microscope, we will see thickening of interlobular septa by sclerosis. That's why the name sclerosing sialodenitis. Lymphocytic and plasma cell infiltration because it's a chronic condition. Periductal fibrosis and loss of asini structure. The management will involve, uh, you know, uh, giving antibiotics, surgical removal of calculi and rehydration to increase the salivary gland flow. Our next doubt is, sialography in normal salivary gland reveals the ductal architecture having appearance of. And your options are option A, sausage string appearance, option B, fruit laden appearance, option C, leafless tree and option D, ball in hand. The correct answer here is leafless tree. Now, sialography is a technique which involves injection of a radio contrast agent into the salivary uh, ductal structure and followed by radiographic examination. So normal salivary glands, your parotid glands, as you can see in this picture, shows appearance of a leafless tree. Now in Jogren syndrome, you get a characteristic appearance of a fruit laden tree or a cherry blossom tree, as you can see in this picture. In case of sialolithiasis, when the duct is obstructed and there are numerous strictures in the duct, you get the classic sausage string appearance. And the ball in hand appearance is seen in salivary gland tumors, which looks something like this. I could not find a actual good rad you know, radiograph to show you this. Now, the third question, a 40-year-old male complains of painless, gradually increasing swelling in the auricular region with a raised earlobe. 99% uh, technetium per technetate scanning revealed that is, the, that is the scintigraphy scanning revealed a hot spot during scintigraphy examination what should be the diagnosis and your options are option a pleomorphic adenoma option b warthens tumor option c canalicular adenoma and option d lymph duct blockage the correct answer here is warthens tumor now, scintigraphy is a technique in nuclear, nuclear medicine where we inject, um, you know, radioactive uh, new material into the, you know, various uh, tissues and organs. And there are certain areas where the radionuclide collects, which appears as a hot spot. And these are usually areas of uh, excessive metabolic activity. And the other areas where uh, the radionucleotide is not taken up as, they appear as cold spots. Now for salivary gland lesions in specific, sodium perpectinate is actively concentrated and secreted by salivary glands. So that's why we use 99 technetium in this technique. And it is not taken up by majority of the lesions like pleomorphic adenoma, sialolithiasis, canalicular adenoma because uh, and they appear as cold spots. Now the reason it is not uh, taken up by these lesions are that so most of the salivary gland neoplasms are slow growing so the metabolic activity is low the only exception to this is your warthens tumor which appears as a hot spot and the probable reason for this is maybe uh, you know active uh, concentration of uh, lymphoid uh, particles in warthens tumor 
which involves both your P, B, B cell and T cell mechanisms. Now moving on to our next question, fourth, uh, what is ranula? Now as the options are A, retention cyst of sublingual gland, option B, retention cyst of submandibular gland, option C, extra vasation cyst of uh, sublingual gland, option D, extra vasation cyst of submandibular gland. So we if know that ranula is a mucosal found in the floor of the mouth and it is usually associated found in the sublingual space and in association with the ducts of the sublingual gland and we also know that it is a pseudocyst so retention cysts are the one which are pseudocysts so the correct option is your a retention cyst of sublingual gland now our fifth question says in clinical evaluation the most significant finding accompanying the parotid mass may be and your options are a rapid progressive painless enlargement option b nodular consistency option c supraauricular and preauricular lymphadenopathy and d facial paralysis so the correct answer here is option c supraauricular and preauricular lymphadenopathy now understand that the purpose of clinical evaluation is to come to the uh, you know probable diagnosis so if we have an enlarged parotid gland we can either have it with lymphadenopathy or without lymphadenopathy now if it is with lymphadenopathy that means the cause is definitely an inf uh, infective cause so we can you know uh, probably it can point towards mumps However, it is with, if it is without lymphadenopathy, then it can be any benign and malignant neoplasm. Now, the other features given here, like your uh, nodular consistency. So, usually it is in tumors that the parotid gland will have a nodular consistency and then further investigations are required. If we have uh, facial paralysis, that is definitely due to encroachment of a tumor onto the facial nerve, compressing it, resulting in facial paralysis. So all the other features and also rapid progressive painless enlargement. Usually, mumps are not characterized by painless enlargement. So out of all the features given, only C is uh, pointing towards a different diagnosis. That's why in this question, we are taking it as a most significant finding. Our sixth question is, a painful crater-like ulcer develops within one week on the hard palate mucosa of a 40-year-old female. The most likely diagnosis is, and your options are option A, actinomycosis, option B, squamous cell carcinoma, option C, pleomorphic adenoma, option D, necrotizing sialometaplasia. The correct answer here is option D, necrotizing sialometaplasia. Now, this is a pretty straightforward question. We will obviously not go with pleomorphic adenoma because uh, it's very rarely found in the palate. The common site is your uh, parotid gland. Almost two-thirds of pleomorphic adenomas are seen in parotid glands. Uh, again, squamous cell carcinoma of palate is rare with incidence of only 5% of the total squamous cell carcinomas um, uh, being in the palatal region. Actinomycosis will show, um, again, it... Uh, the cervicofacial variant will rarely affect the oral mucous membrane. And even if it affects, the classic features are um, periodontitis, abscesses, sinus tract, and woody fibrosis. So, uh, decrotizing sialometaplasia is non-neoplastic inflammation of palate. And the clinical features are it is usually a painless ulcer, but sometimes can cause pain and numbness. And it's usually a crateriform ulcer as mentioned here about 1 to 3 millimeters in diameter. Histologically, we see a pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, but no dysplastic features. We see coagulation necrosis of glandular acini. That is why the term salivary gland infarction is also used for the lesion, because even in myocardial infarction, you see coagulative necrosis. Then we have squamous metaplasia of ducts, mucin pooling, and macrophage are the cells in the cellular infiltrate. Our seventh question is, Warthin's tumor is, your options are option A, an adenolymphoma of parotid gland, B, a pleomorphic adenoma of parotid gland, option C, carcinoma of parotid gland, and option D, none of the above. Our correct answer is an adenolymphoma of parotid gland. The other name of uh, 
your uh, Wharton's tumor is papillary cyst adenoma lymphomatosum or adenolymphoma. Now, grossly, the lesion will com uh, comprise of multiple cystic spaces. And uh, if you look at it through the microscope, you have an ep two components, epithelial and a lymphoid tissue. So the epithelium, as the name is suggesting, will be adenoma with cyst formation. And we have papillary projections into the cystic spaces. That's why the name papillary cyst adenoma lymphomatosum. And the epithelium here will be bilayer, oncocytic bilayered epithelium. The inner layer is usually tall columnar as you can see. And the outer layer is oncocytic uh, triangular eosinophilic coagulum is also seen in the cystic spaces. And the other component, lymphoid tissue, is usually lymphoid matrix with germinal centers. It's nothing but a reactive cellular infiltrate which involves both B and T cell mediated immunities. Our eighth question is reduction in flow of saliva is not seen in and your options are A, elderly diabetics. Now in elderly diabetics, we do see, uh, see it because of neuropathy. B, uh, patients undergoing radiation therapy. Again, saliva flow, flow is reduced because of damage to salivary gland. Option C is patients suffering from Parkinsonism. And option D is patients on phenothiazine drugs. Again, phenothiazine drugs, which are antipsychotic drugs, also have an anti-muscarinic effect. So they decrease the acetylcholine secretion, causes some, some amount of uh, dryness of mouth. So the correct answer here is going to be patients suffering from Parkinsonism. Our last question is parotid fatty change is a sign of and your options are aging, alcoholism, malnutrition and D, none of the above. The correct answer is A, aging. As the name suggests, parotid fatty change involves replacement of glandular tissue with fat. And it is usually seen in aging, obesity, certain metabolic disorders and malignancies. With this, we uh, finish our salivary gland tumor doubts. Thank you.